Um, I'd like to introduce you to Tessa Watt, who's a mindfulness teacher. Thank you. My name is Tessa. I'm a, um, a mindfulness teacher, and uh, I've also written a, a little book about mindfulness. And for a long time, I was a, a radio producer for the BBC. That was my kind of career for much of my adult life. Um, and when I was just starting off as a trainee producer, it was quite stressful doing live radio and having to get everything happening on time and so on. Um, so at one point I went on a holiday and so I had that experience, which I think many people have when they work very hard, that I couldn't really relax even when I was on holiday. Um, and I had bought myself a little book uh, called Teach Yourself Meditation at the uh, airport and it had a candle on it. So I kind of followed the instructions and did a bit of... Um, counting breaths and that kind of thing. And then, you know, my first kind of um, motivation was really just to calm down. But as I started to get into it more, I realized that actually there's a lot more to it than just calming down. That it's really um, about shifting our whole way of relating to ourselves in the world. So, um, it's something, mindfulness is becoming quite a a sort of buzzword these days if you if you read things to do with health and well-being but it's not it's not a new age thing it's something that's been around for thousands of years and it's really at the very simplest it's just about um, being present um, it's about kind of being right here as opposed to what we actually notice if we start to look at our minds that a lot of the time we're not really here we're busy kind of replaying scenes from the past or we're busy worrying about the future, making plans, and a lot of the time we're not actually noticing what's right here in front of our noses. And so it means that often we go through our lives really not appreciating what's here. You know, we kind of go into this mode of autopilot where we walk home from the tube and we find ourselves with the key in the door and we've completely missed the journey. You know, where we have, we have a meal and we get to the end of the meal, we didn't taste the food. Um, so, mindfulness is really about how can we train ourselves to kind of appreciate our lives and, and realize that, you know, as we're going through them, this is it, <laughs> this is the life. And um, I guess, you know, Captain Sensible's song about you know, noticing the moon floating in the sky, looking like a lily on, on a lake, <laughs> or, um, or the star looking like a toy, or the bird learning how to sing. So it's, it's these little things that are actually making up our lives. Um, and sometimes I think also, you know, songs like that, it's very much about a kind of rural idyll. So it's like we think it's wonderful and easy to be mindful when we're out in the countryside and we've got birds and, you know, lovely stars and moons and so on. Um, but really, you know, it's about being right here now, wherever we are. And uh, I actually ran a project at one point called Slow Down London which was really on exactly this theme. How can we sort of celebrate the fact that we live here in this big, crazy city? Um, how can we actually slow down and enjoy it? And um, it was a, a festival that we did. Well, we've done a number of projects, but we worked with people like the Ramblers and the, the RSPB, the Bird People, and various kind of art galleries and so on, and saying, for example, you know, could you go to an art gallery and could you just look at a few things and enjoy them, you know, instead of, running through and you go to the big exhibition and you pay your money and then you have to see, you know, 150 paintings and you're just reading the captions, you're not actually seeing the, the pictures. So how could we slow down um, and, and really enjoy what's here? And often I think in London we're really sold the idea that everywhere else is nicer. So if you're standing on the, you know, waiting for a tube, there's a big billboard, you know, selling you that there's a beautiful island with a turquoise sea and a lovely beach and, you know, it'd be nicer to be there rather than here. Um, so with mindfulness, we can maybe start to appreciate being here. So um, this is kind of sounds quite simple to say, um, but actually, when we you know when we look at our minds, as I said, we tend to to find that the mind gets very speedy. It gets very caught up in its own habitual ways of thinking. You probably experience that you might have you know some kinds of negative trains of thought that just come round and round and round and it's hard to get rid of them. And this is uh, definitely an experience that's increasing, uh, that we're finding that uh, mental health 
is becoming the biggest health issue that there is um, now, and soon, soon it will actually be the largest um, sort of health problem on the planet. Um, various kinds of mental health and stress will be bigger kind of costs to all the health systems than other kinds of physical health problems. And um, they're finding, for example, that children are getting um, depression from a very, very early age. Obviously, stress is costing you know the NHS billions every year. Um, so all of these kind of um, issues of stress and anxiety and so on are a lot to do with the way that we get caught in these kinds of habitual thoughts that we're not able to let go of. And so mindfulness is, is giving us some practices, some actual techniques that we can learn where we can actually practice letting go of, of all those thought patterns and just coming back to something really simple that is, is right here. Um, and so it's something that we do um, in mindfulness training. We're just using these practices as a way we set aside time and we pay attention to something very simple. Often it's something to do with body. So it'll be you know paying attention to our body sensations or paying attention to the breath because the body is always here. The mind goes off somewhere else, but the body is you know, right here. So we use the body as a way of um, coming back to the present. Um, so normally when I would talk about mindfulness, we would kind of do a little bit of practice. So I think we'll try and just do a little bit um, if you're willing for that. First of all, though, I think it's nice to just um, kind of know who else is around and kind of go through this little um, process together. So I'd just like to invite you, if you want to just take a minute, um, maybe we can have the house lights up again, and just, if you can find someone you don't know that's near you, and just take a minute to kind of introduce yourself, and just say something about who you are, why you're here, if there's any, if you know anything about mindfulness, or maybe you're here because of some other thing that happened this evening, like the food bank, or Captain Sensible, or, so anything at all that you'd like to just share with your neighbour, and please, if it, if it's threes, that's fine. Just make sure there isn't someone sitting all by themselves right next to you. So if you want to just take a moment to talk to someone. <laughs> Some mindfulness in the past um, and have always found it very powerful but it was taught to me as a kind of concentration of attention I, I mean but but like you say being in the moment whatever it is you're doing and therefore it occupies you and your mind doesn't need to go wandering elsewhere but I do feel now especially in mental health services in Croydon at least um, every time you're offered mindfulness or there's discussion about a mindfulness course it's followed up, it's not meditation. 
but it inevitably turns out that in some ways it feels to me as though it is, and I wonder whether they're doing that because mindfulness sounds acceptable, whereas meditation sounds mystical and maybe religious, or whether the concept of mindfulness is shifting to incorporate meditation. very much about becoming mindful of the self. And in the end, I kind of thought of it, um, like, where do you go with that? Mm -hmm. I'm not Buddhist anymore. But what I found really interesting about John's approach is how he's linking it with the community. And I've never really heard that before. So I think it's very original. And I want to hear more. So um, I just want to rejoice in John <laughs> and making that connection. So I think it's a really important connection. That's, uh, yes, excellent. <laughs> You've got a lot of friends here, John. <laughs> Quite rightly. <rightly. laughs> Great. Now that's a lovely point, and that's uh, oh, someone else here wanted to make a point. <laughs> I'm I'm here to prove that having the entertainment at the beginning gets people to come in, because I only originally came because um, I'm related to one of the musicians, and um, I then found out that it was going to include mindfulness and the food bank thing and everything. And I thought that sounds absolutely lovely. Um, I've been practicing, I believe, mindfulness over the years, but I did it via yoga. Because that ordinary happy yoga is focusing on just one thing at a time. And I'm a, a practicing spiritual healer in Croydon. And the whole, the whole area is sort of merging all, all the different things. There are people here um, who have been to our clinic and had healing. There are people here that have been to yoga classes. There are, you know, and we're all, we're all merging um, from all our different, different areas. And I think it's absolutely lovely. And, and having the music at the beginning, um, and then the inspirational stuff from the lovely Fatima, um, I think is, you know, it's, it's tying it all together. And I just hope I'll be able to get down to some of the others. Although Tuesday's not a good day, but um, say I, I came in from the wrong end. I didn't come in looking for mindfulness. <laughs> I, I don't think there is a wrong end. So great, excellent. Good evening, everybody. I just come down here for the music at the beginning. I didn't know how all this other stuff was going on, but I do find it really, really interesting. I have done meditation myself in the past, and as the gentleman over there said, he finds it a spiritual and a religious thing. And as the lady just said there. It's more of a spiritual thing within yourself. I think a meditation and a mindfulness is not about a religion or anything else. It's about how you feel inside, about how you interpret it, life and people within you and around you. And it's an understanding. I went to meditation with a friend who was a really violent man. And after him doing meditation, you know, you wouldn't think he was, he's one of the most calmest and calm, calmastic men you'd ever understand or even meet. He is a brilliant man from being a violent man to being a calm man, just through meditation. It was nothing to do with religion, just a matter of understanding himself and what was going on around him. So, thank you everyone. Thank you very much. The techniques that we use in mindfulness, uh, they come from you know, thousands of years old, and generally I think most uh, spiritual traditions have some kind of mindfulness practice in, in them. Um, some practice of kind of being still and being with yourself and being kind of connecting, um, you know, with, with that kind of stillness and space. And it might have different names, you know, some traditions might call it prayer or um, different, different titles for it. Um, in certain traditions, Buddhism particularly, they've always been very, very interested in how the mind works and in how you can train the mind. So the techniques that we use in the mindfulness practice um, are often, many of them are from the Buddhist tradition um, and they also, we use things from the yoga tradition that, that uh, you mentioned. So very much working with, you know, just paying attention to the body. Um, but in the last few decades, 
there have been people who've had the inspiration to really say, you know, that these, these practices don't have to be connected with any particular belief system, they don't have to be connected with any particular spiritual tradition. If you've got a spiritual tradition, that's great. Or if you, you know, very vehemently atheist, that's also fine. So you can kind of use these practices in whatever way you want, and they are perfectly compatible with whatever your own belief system is. And so I think one reason why the, the word mindfulness has become so popular is because it's been moved into a secular situation and people feel safe that they can come to those classes and no one's going to kind of try and convert them into any particular religion. So I think that, that's one reason why it's um, being used that way. Um, and it's also being um, very much studied. You know, there's a, a next week, if you come back next week, there's a woman called Tamara Russell, who's from, is it King's College? Is that it? Yeah. Who's going to talk about the science of it. Um, and there's incredible science coming out now that shows that you can actually kind of reprogram your mind, that you can reprogram yourself from being a, an anxious, depressed kind of person to being much more buoyant, much more resilient. And they're actually doing you know, scans of the brain that show that the, the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are responsible for emotional well-being and resilience and so on are all strengthened by these practices. So um, if that's something that would interest you to know more about, then you should definitely come next week because tomorrow we'll have lots to say about that. Um, so I think that's the other thing is that now these practices that people have been doing for centuries are being sanctioned by modern science. And, um, and by medicine and by psychotherapy and so on, so people feel more comfortable with them. Um, and I think also you were making a really interesting point about your friend who was violent. Um, so this is another thing that is a real benefit to these practices, is that they're just about slowing down and having a bit of space and being able to sort of have the time that you don't just go into an automatic reaction. So, you know, often people can completely ruin their lives in five seconds because they reacted quickly, you know, they, they took out the knife or the gun or whatever it was, and then that's it, you know, for the rest of their life. And this is training the mind, you know, training your ability to actually feel difficult emotions, to feel them come up and not have to actually immediately go into some kind of reaction, but actually to be able to, you know, stay, stay with those feelings without you know, going into violence or going into aggression or whatever it is. Um, Could I just, uh, please, this happened, yeah. This happened to Jamie over a match of four or five weeks. I'm not talking about years. Wow. Well, four, four or five weeks made a difference, yeah. That's incredible. So obviously not all of us are, are prone to kind of, you know, physical violence or someone, but probably all of us, you know, sometimes shout at our kids or our <laughs> spouse or whatever. So. Uh, this is something that can be quite helpful in terms of just you know being able to have that little bit more space. So um, maybe we should just do a little bit of practice. And if you don't feel like doing this, don't worry. You can just sit there and daydream or whatever you want to do. So please don't feel that you're um, kind of roped into something you don't want to do. Um, but if you'd like to try a bit of practice, I'd suggest that you um, just sit comfortable in your chair and try and take an upright sort of posture. If you're feeling stiff, you know, maybe just take a moment to sort of give the shoulders a wriggle or have a stretch. And we'll just take, you know, maybe five minutes to do a, a short practice where we'll, we'll work with being with the body and the breath, which is um, kind of the main things that we work with in these, in these practices. So when we take an upright posture, there's a feeling you know, often if you slump, there's a sense that the mind is also slumping, there's a feeling of kind of down, depression sort of feeling. So just by taking a really good posture, that in itself is, is kind of stating our willingness in a way to just to uplift ourselves and to kind of be with whatever's coming up, even if that's not always easy. And then we can really feel the sense of groundedness. So, um, and I can say this myself, I'm quite a speedy person, and when I, when I speed up, it's like I'm, my feet are not touching the ground. It's all up in the head. So it's kind of, how can we actually feel now that the feet are on the ground? You can take a moment to, um, if you want to feel the, the feeling of the shoes. You've got 
contact of, of your toes with the, with the shoes. You've got contact of the soles of the feet with the floor. And so just take a moment to really feel those sensations. What's it like to have the feet on the floor, to have that contact with the ground? So we're taking our mind out of this busy, busy brain kind of area and taking it down into the feet and feeling the big toe and the middle toes and the little toe and feeling the, the soles of the feet, the padded balls, the instep. You can notice if your shoes feel comfortable or tight, is there any way that they're pinching? And just taking, and you can do this practice by the way either with your eyes open or closed, so whatever feels comfortable for you. And then just taking the awareness up uh, into the lower part of the legs, so just notice your calves and whether you can feel anything there, maybe the calf muscles, maybe the shins, is there any kind of little aching or twinging? And don't worry if your mind goes off somewhere, that's really natural. So the mind will often wander off, it might do that a lot. And each time that you notice that the mind has gone somewhere else, just see if you can notice that and gently bring it back. So this is not a problem at all, we're not trying to kind of keep our mind perfectly on the focus of attention, we're just bringing it back very gently each time it goes away. And then you can notice your knees, is there any aching? Can you notice the kneecaps and the undersides of the knees? And the thighs. And maybe you can feel the weight of the bottom on the chair, the sit bones, for the lower back. Maybe there's tightness or aching there. Noticing the Feeling the spine rising up. And the front of the body, the belly and the chest. And you can notice your hands, are they sitting on your lap or hanging down? <coughs> Just feel what that feels like. Is there any feeling of the sensations of the hands touching something, some kind of texture? <coughs> And if you do have thoughts, you know, whatever they are, you're thinking, oh, this is a bit strange, or you're thinking about something you have to do, whatever it is, just notice that, and again, just keep bringing the mind back every time it wanders. And see if you can do that with a sort of kindly attitude, so we're not judgmental about our minds, we're just noticing, being very friendly to whatever is here. And then noticing, coming up the body, noticing the upper arms and the shoulders, perhaps there's tightness in the shoulders, any other sensations. And then noticing the head, the head and neck, the face, top of the head, Just any sensations that you're feeling. And then having a sense of the whole body, so you've got this whole body from the crown of the head down to the feet, and just allowing it to feel whatever sensations are here. Maybe you're a bit tired and achy, or wired up, or whatever sensations are in the body. You don't have to struggle with those, just let them be as they are. And then noticing that although the body is fairly still, probably, that there is some movement in it, which is the breath moving in the body. So you can just notice that you're breathing. Maybe you noticed that already. Perhaps you've been breathing all along and just not noticing. So you, you don't have to do anything special with your breath. Sometimes in traditions like yoga we do some, some special kinds of breathing, but here you're just, just noticing the fact that you're breathing you can see where do you feel the breath, is it in the belly, is it in the chest, the nostrils. So 
So see if you can kind of feel those physical sensations of breathing without having to change them. You're just letting your breath breathe itself. be just a bit like the waves of the sea, the way the breath kind of moves in and out. So you're bringing awareness right up close to those sensations of breathing, whether wherever it is that you're, you're feeling it. also allow the sounds to be there, for example, the sounds outside, so we don't have to be in perfect silence or anything like that, you can just let the sounds be there. Just a sense of breathing in and breathing out. a very simple act that actually was telling us that we're alive and often we might take that for granted. So here we're just bringing awareness to the breath, noticing the fact that we're breathing. Breathing in, breathing out, very simple. Just letting the breath breathe itself. So your breath knows perfectly well how to breathe. And just bringing awareness to the fact that it's happening quite naturally. to come to the end of this um, short little practice so just take your time to open your eyes if they've been closed in your own time if you're feeling stiff feel free to have a little stretch easier to do in a group than on my own at home mm -hmm. yes. um, and I'm never quite sure why that is. Yeah, yeah. I think that's very true. I think that's a very common experience. That's one of the reason why it's nice to have mindfulness classes and groups and things. <coughs> Anyone else? Is a comment over here? Thank you. Um, I was going to say I came tonight for community. I'm very interested in community. But the um, meditation was great because it made me feel that, um, that my concentration was solely on me 
And when my mind began to wander and say, well, it would be really good if I do this on the coach trip next week, um, I was able to bring it back to what I was actually doing. So I found it very, very good. And um, I think it's really interesting um, what you said about community because I think also I would second what someone else already said about bringing this together with what John's doing here. It's a bit radical to bring the mindfulness and the, and the community together. Um, and one of the things I think people have this idea that you know doing something like mindfulness or meditation is somehow selfish and you go off into a, your room by yourself or you know the image of a hermit in a cave or something. Um, but really it's, you know, the more that we're able to be, because we're cultivating an ability to be um, aware and also kind of friendly to ourselves, to kind of allow things to be as they are. And the more we can do that with ourselves, the more we're able to, to do that with other people. And the more that we're kind of able to be present and not just off in our own kind of trip in our heads, the more we're actually able to see what's around us and notice what needs doing. So like someone like the wonderful Fatima who, noticed what needed doing in Croydon and has done it. So the more we do these kinds of practices, it actually enables us then to open up to the world around us and go, oh, okay, <laughs> here's somebody who needs my help. So yeah, thank you for that, that comment. Any other um, comments about your, anything that came up for you during the, that little practice? Anybody find it extremely excruciating? Please, please share. <laughs> you'll, you'll give other people, yes? <laughs> I would say excruciating, but I found it very difficult to focus because um, I'm one of these people that just has a million things on my mind, and I'm one of these people that I mean I overthink stuff all the time. So <laughs> yeah, for me it's always very difficult. I mean I do like meditation in the morning, but even still I don't feel like it's really proper. I'm just one of those people who find it very difficult to focus sometimes, but maybe that's just me needing to practice. And so you find your mind is just when we yeah. your mind is very busy. Yeah, yeah. my mind is very yeah. busy. It can yeah. be shocking how busy the mind yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, yeah, um, I struggle a bit as well. I um I do practice um as much as I can. Um but I, I found I um was quite uncomfortable because I'm tired. Mm -hmm. When I'm tired I, I the aches and pains really You were able to sit with it, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that the, the fact of doing it with a group is also useful. And sometimes I'll meditate and think, as I, my time is not going on for How long is this going to go on for? You know, you can think, the end of the end. Yeah. But um, I think mm -hmm. it's so that's really, and that's really helpful what you're saying about just staying with it. So this is what we're really cultivating is the ability to actually just stay with it even when it doesn't feel very comfortable and when the mind feels incredibly busy. And that may not feel, you know, you might get to the end of a mindfulness practice and you think, oh, I haven't really been doing it. But actually just by being willing to sit there and be with that is actually really helpful in, in terms of what we were talking about earlier, you know, being with, with challenging emotions, challenging thoughts and not reacting to them. You know, if you can just stay there, let all that happen, it's kind of strengthening the ability to actually you know, be with difficult things and not have to go off on one, you know, and shout at somebody or, you know, react in some unhelpful way. So, yeah. Any other comments anyone would like to make, please? I have a very strong vibration, you know, so I feel that today I'm surrounded by some very good people. You had a feeling of being surrounded by very good people. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Strangely enough, I did yoga years ago and uh, it took me back in time. And it was like yoga in a sitting position, but just using the mind rather than the exercise of the body. Um, it kind of took me back and I thought, I didn't know this was on this evening. 
came to see my daughter sing and her friend sing, and that was great. And I thought that was it. And this is sort of extra. And after the, the food bank, which I thought, wow, the food bank was just amazing. Um, and you think, well, you're in an affluent town, at Croydon, but you're not. It's only parts of it's affluent, and parts of it's very poor. And the events of two years ago actually spelled that out in a big way. Um, but this is more positive. Um, and I wasn't aware of mindfulness, but through yoga, I was. Yeah. And I got a link with somebody <coughs> this evening, which I wasn't expecting. So, there we are. And that was nice. Thank you. Great. Good. So, um, if you're interested in kind of carrying on with mindfulness in some way, there's lots of, you know, um, people teaching courses and so on. Um, so, you know, please kind of investigate that. I'm sure John can tell you about different ways and there are online things and books and so on. Um, and it's, it doesn't have to be, I mean, we can do these formal practices, but we can also do what you could call informal mindfulness practice, which is really just about noticing when we're not here. So you can, you know, make a cup of tea mindfully, or you can kind of walk your dog mindfully, or you can wash the dishes mindfully. So it's just really about kind of doing whatever it is you're doing. You could call it unitasking <laughs> instead of multitasking. You know, just doing one thing at a time, and when you find that you've gone off somewhere else, you can just keep bringing the mind back. And just by doing those kinds of things, we can kind of slowly retrain ourselves. I think it's one reason why it is such a buzzword at the moment is because everything in our society is pushing the other way. You know, we're being kind of um, encouraged to do 25 things at once, and we're kind of texting, and we're on the web, and we're watching, you know, video, and all these things all at the same time. Um, and especially, I've got two teenage daughters. You know, like that age group, they're just it's kind of frenetic. There's sort of we're being reprogrammed to be this kind of crazy. Um, over agitated, over busy, over entertained people. So I think there is kind of some kind of movement now that people are saying, right, this is enough. Let's go back to just being a little bit more simple. Let's do one thing at a time. Um, so I'd just like to um, end with um, a little uh, reading from one of my favorite writers. Uh, she was actually a Buddhist, but she's um, uh, tiny little gnome-like figure, a um, Buddhist nun called Pema Chudron. She was married a couple of times and had kids and so on before she um, went into this particular path. Um, and so this is her, um, from her book called The Wisdom of No Escape and the Path of Loving Kindness. The sense of wonder and delight is present in every moment, every breath, every step, every movement of our own, ordinary, everyday lives, if we can connect with it. The greatest obstacle to connecting with our joy is resentment. Joy has to do with seeing how big, how completely unobstructed, and how precious things are. Resenting what happens to you and complaining about your life are like refusing to smell the wild roses when you go for a morning walk, or like being so blind that you don't see a huge black raven when it lands in the tree that you're sitting under. We can get so caught up in our own personal pain or worries that we don't notice that the wind has come up or someone put flowers on the dining room table. Resentment, bitterness, and holding a grudge prevent us from seeing and hearing and tasting and delighting. There's a story of a woman running away from tigers. She runs and runs, and the tigers are getting closer and closer. When she comes to the edge of a cliff, she sees some vines there. So she climbs down and holds onto the vines. Looking down, she sees that there are tigers below her as well. She then notices that a mouse is gnawing away at the vine to which she is clinging. She also sees a beautiful little bunch of strawberries close to her, growing out of a clump of grass. She looks up and she looks down. She looks at the mouse. Then she just takes a strawberry, puts it in her mouth, and enjoys it thoroughly. Tigers above, tigers below. This is actually the predicament that we're always in, in terms of our birth and death. Each moment is just what it is. It might be the only moment of our life. It might be the only strawberry we'll ever eat. We could get depressed about it, or we could finally appreciate it and delight in the preciousness of every single moment of our life. <laughs>